Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, my privilege to introduce uh, uh, someone I've known for a long time in astronomy, uh, Ellen Zweibel, who is a professor at the University of Wisconsin and is this year's Sackler Lecture. Uh, so she was a grad student in Princeton and worked with all the greats, like Lyman Spitzer and Russell Coltera and Jerry Ostreicher, and then uh, did a postdoc at the IIS before taking her first faculty job at Boulder, and now she's a uh, has the blessing and the curse of being department chair of the astronomy department of Wisconsin. So she's going to tell us today about positive physics and cosmic curves. Thanks, Steve. It's, it's always great to visit SIGA. Um, I, I love seeing who the, who the postdocs are and of course the faculty. Um, so I'm going to talk about the macrophysics and microphysics of cosmic rays. So galaxies are pervaded by magnetic fields relativistic particles. And what you see here on the left is, um, do we see it? Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is the nonverbal continuum of radiation from the spiral galaxy M51. The little black line segments show the orientation <coughs> of the magnetic field in the Planck sky as revealed by synchrotron radiation. So for a long time, we've been able to study the electron component of cosmic rays. And more, re more recently, gamma ray astronomy has made it possible to study the signature of nuclear components. So here we see um, a molecular cloud illuminated by, by gamma rays. So um, the, the contours represent the CO emission, and the uh, colored pixels represent the intensity of gamma rays. So the overarching question that I want to address in this talk is how is energy partitioned between thermal gas, magnetic fields, and cosmic rays in galaxies? In particular, how is it that one billionth of interstellar particles have as much energy as the background gas? So this defies conventional thermodynamics. Second question, how do cosmic rays couple thermally and dynamically to the background despite being virtually collisionless. So the gamma ray emission that you saw is a result of direct nuclear collisions, but those are very rare. And as we'll see, there's an electromagnetic coupling, which is, under many conditions, much more powerful. And because of this coupling, and because of the large amount of energy in cosmic rays, they can play a role in regulating their environments. And I'll say something about that, too. So in this talk, I'll give a brief introduction to cosmic rays. And then I'll talk about um, something we can call cosmic ray hydrodynamics, which is basically a fluid treatment of cosmic rays, despite the fact that they form this relativistic collisionless gas. And I'll mention a couple of applications, uh, one being to galactic winds, which are very important for the evolution of galaxies in the intergalactic medium. And another example has shown how they can heat interstellar gas. I'll say a little bit about what laboratory experiments can do. And I'd like to acknowledge um, collaborators that I've had um, now and over the years. And the names in green uh, are our graduate students. And um, so you're well known to be a raucous audience, so I hope that you will interrupt me along the way and ask questions. OK. So, I'd like to show two views of the cosmic ray energy spectrum. I like this image because it gives you some idea of the huge array of experiments that we have for detecting cosmic rays at different energies. So you can see that uh, it's well described by kind of a broken power law over many decades in energy. <coughs> um, this feature here at about 3 um, PeV is called the knee. And this flattening here is, is called the angle. Um, this is the electron spectrum. The positrons are thought to be only secondary, so we can have protons, um, protons only, all particles. These low energy particles are severely modulated <coughs> by the solar wind. Um, and I like to show this image because it gives you some idea of the fluxes of particles at these energies. So here, these. Um, Ultra high energy ones at this, above the so called angle arrive at about one particle per kilometer squared per year. So they're, um, they're very, very rare. And I'll talk about them mostly in my public lecture because um, that will be more speculative and less rigorous. And we don't yet know where these ultra high energy cosmic rays come from. Um, so here I want to concentrate 
been discovered in the cosmic ray sky at energies above a TeV. Uh, they seem to be robust. They've been repeated in many experiments, and they really form a challenge to theory to understand what can produce uh, these anisotropies. Are we seeing an imprint of sources? Is there some acceleration mechanism going on? It's really not clear, but I want to really address this much in my talk. Um, so at the GeV energies, there's mostly protons. There seems to be a transition to heavier nuclei at the higher energies. The electrons are way down, one to two percent by number. Um, the elemental composition is very similar to the solar system. So in red, you see the solar system abundances, and in blue, you see the cosmic ray abundances. But they're super enriched in the light elements, lithium, beryllium, and boron. And that is interpreted <coughs> as due to spallation of CNO cosmic rays on interstellar nuclei. And from the amount of spallation that's occurred, we can estimate how much material cosmic rays have gone through and translate that into a lifetime. I'll show you the results of that in a couple slides. So we, we can't directly probe cosmic rays in other galaxies uh, as well as we can in our own, but I want to mention this far infrared radio correlation that seems to hold you know, up to <coughs> a moderate redshift, maybe redshift of two. So here is the Here's the far infrared luminosity, the log, and here is the radio luminosity. So uh, this is a measure of the star formation rate, because this is reprocessed uh, starlight, and this is um, synchrotron emissivity. And you can see that over many orders of magnitude in luminosity, um, this somewhat superlinear relation holds, holds quite tightly. And if we take into account that the synchrotron luminosity is roughly proportional to the product of the magnetic and the cosmic ray energy densities, um, and this is proportional to the star formation rate, there seems to be some kind of self-regulation mechanism between magnetic field generation, cosmic ray acceleration, and star formation. They seem to be linked in uh, some very reproducible way across galaxies and many times. Okay, so what implications can we draw So one, the particles are accelerated in the interstellar medium. Now, this was um, this came as something of a surprise. Um, you probably uh, know that that supernovae have kind of long been disfigured as the uh, source of cosmic rays. So the most natural thing to think was that the cosmic rays were actually supernova ejecta, and they should therefore be very enriched in the R process elements. But they're not. The composition is very close to solar, with the exception of these spallation products. So although the energy for accelerating cosmic rays seems to come from supernovae, uh, the particles themselves seem to be representative of the interstellar medium. We can explain the isotropy, directional isotropy, and the uh, confinement times of a few to 10 million years um, by the galactic magnetic field. So there's the galactic magnetic field confines the particles uh, to the disk or a thick disk in the galaxy. And there are also, there's also something in the magnetic field which scatters them and washes out any trace of their source. <coughs> and if we take the measured cosmic ray energy density in lifetimes, we can estimate that the cosmic ray luminosity is about 10% of galactic supernova luminosity. And by 10%, I mean 10% of the 1% that doesn't come out in neutrinos. So about 10 to the 50 herbs per cosmic ray. Yeah? When you say the initial source is supernova, are you specifically supernova or transfer uh, or specifically the energies? So, um, so this idea that they come from supernovae um, pre, long predated the uh, discovery of gamma ray herbs. It was actually a proposal by Bada and Swicky in 1934. So they didn't know from gamma ray bursts. They just knew that um, supernovae are very energetic and cosmic rays are very energetic and maybe they're associated with it in some way. Um, later, there were more quantitative theories in which, um, so basically as the, uh, as the shock propagates through the envelope, uh, a tail of particles would be extracted and these would be the cosmic rays. Uh, so that was one theory, for example, put forward by Sterling. Um, I think <coughs> their ultra-high energy cosmic ray acceleration in magnetars 
which is like the Milky Way of the star. <coughs> Everything is about a thousand times, you know, the magnetic energy density, the gas energy density, the concentration, they're all about a thousand times greater than they are in the Milky Way. And um, to my surprise, at least, um, we were able to get a uh, good fits to the gamma ray spectra, uh, the Fermi uh, gamma rays at lower energy, the Veritas gamma rays at higher energy, we were able to get a good fit to the radio spectra. Uh, we don't have too many free parameters in this <coughs> but, um, Since we were able to get good fits, we were able to put constraints on some parameters that are not as well measured as uh, things like the gas density, <coughs> in particular the strength of the magnetic field and speed of the wind that we can observe from M2. Uh, so these are chi-square plots of um, for several different models <coughs> of input spectra and density. And you can see magnetic field strength here, wind speed here. You can see that there's kind of a, a valley of minimum chi-square in all these plots. And what this represents is that as you increase the magnetic field strength in order not to overproduce synchrotron radiation, you have to add back the electrons away faster. So that accounts for the general shape of these curves. Um, we tried to see uh, you know, how well things would work for more extreme objects, and we decided to look at ARC-220, which actually has not had a gamma ray detection, but it does have a non-thermal uh, radio continuum. And um, in a paper that we just submitted, we, we put together this table. So Milky Way, um, M82, the east and west nuclei of ARC-220. So this is a galaxy that seems to be merging your two nuclei. And um, so we, we found that the cosmic ray energy density is not keeping pace with the magnetic energy density and the radiation energy density. So in the Milky Way, uh, these things are all in rough X partition. But when we go to ARC220, so here the magnetic field is up by a factor of a thousand, but the cosmic <coughs> so magnetic field <coughs> is the cosmic ray, sorry, the magnetic energy density is up by millions, but the cosmic ray energy density off by less than 3,000. So the cosmic rays are not keeping pace uh, with the other constituents of the interstellar medium. And we think this is because um, the density of the gas is very high, and um, collisional losses for the cosmic rays are enormous. So in the galaxy, um, the lifetime against collisions of a sort of a few GeV cosmic ray proton is um, more than 10 million years, it's close to 100 million years. In um, ARC-220, it's 100 to 1,000 years. So there's a powerful source of cosmic rays, but they're just getting snuffed out by collisions. We think that's what's going on. How so, do you estimate the cosmic rays? Ah, okay. So, so we have the, um, so we have the, the observations of the non-thermal continuum. And um, we have the far infrared luminosity. So we know what the inverse Compton losses are. And uh, we know what the synchrotron losses are as a function of magnetic field. And we're able to fit the spectrum. Um, we get the best fit to the spectrum with those um, values that you saw. So six milligauss, et cetera. Actually, there's a little bit of modeling that goes into that six milligauss, which is um, there are two components in the uh, west nucleus, and we assume that the magnetic field scales at the square root of the gas density, which is happens in the Milky Way. Well, it doesn't measure directly, right? No. Carl, those are mega masers. Right? Carl, Carl Heilson does this. There are mega masers yeah. that hint at milligauss, milligauss field. So actually, yeah. our fits are consistent with what's been found before. So as you go to So, so um, the collisions outpace the advective losses. So in the Milky Way, um, <coughs> the main cosmic ray energy loss is some combination of advection and diffusion, um, which, remove, which removes them in about 10 million years. But 
in these very dense systems, it's, it's just high on production. So, um, so we have a, a prediction uh, for what the gamma ray flux from R220 should be, and if Fermi stays on for another 10 years, we think we should see it. Um, but it's a lot farther away, like 20 times further away than MN2, and we think that's why it happens in sleep. Okay, so in understanding how <coughs> the rays propagate in the galaxy, um, even if we knew the magnetic field perfectly, which of course we don't, um, direct numerical simulation of the orbit would just be infeasible. Um, and that's shown here by um, showing the, the gyro radii of particles of different energies um, and interleaved with the sizes of various objects. So for the GED particles that we're interested in, their, um, their gyro radius is below an AU. So you know, it's just <coughs> infeasible to follow them directly. And so we have to resort to some kind of other way of looking at it. And what we, what we do is we use a, a combination of, of orbit theory, which is basically test particle dynamics plus statistical mechanics, and we kind of break the orbits into a gyro motion around the magnetic field, um, drifts, which I'll describe, caused by inhomogeneity in the field, mirroring the same category, uh, and a process called resonance, <coughs> which I'll explain. And then there are um, collective phenomena which are instabilities that the cosmic rays drive, and that's where the plasma physics comes in. So, how do drifts and mirroring work? Um, well, here is, uh, here's the Earth, and here's a one field line of the dipole field, and the curvature in the field uh, introduces a, a longitudinal drift, so particles drift slowly around the Earth, and as they approach the <coughs> poles where the magnetic field is getting stronger, uh, they, they mirror. And that's because the magnetic moment, which is the perpendicular momentum, perpendicular to the magnetic field, uh, squared divided by B, by B is invariant. So um, as B increases, uh, P perf must increase, and eventually um, P parallel gets as small as B, which is zero, uh, and then the particle turns around. And a kind of a rough rule of thumb is that if you have an inhomogeneity in the field, which varies on some length scale L, uh, much greater than the gyro radius, Rg, then the drift speed will be of order particle speed times the ratio of Rg over L. So that's what leads to slow migration of particles across field lines. So let me say a little bit about gyro resonance pitch angle scattering, because this turns out to be extremely important. So here's a magnetic field line in red that has a um, large scale curvature and um, some very small scale structure. And the black helix uh, represents the orbit of the particle. So it's a lot like riding your bike on um, over hilly terrain with water. <coughs> okay? so, um, so you follow the curve of the road and the uh, small uh, washboard corrugations kind of hurt your hand, but you stay on the bike. But if you hit a place where the, say there's a bump in the field, in, in the road, which is separation of your wheels, you will feel that strongly. That would be a resonant interaction. Same thing happened with um, surfing, maybe not done here so much. Um, and that's called resonant scattering. And here, this is just a simple orbit integration that shows the importance of a resonant kick. And here's a, another cartoon of a particle experiencing the gyro resonance. And so mathematically, the condition is that the Doppler shift of frequency that the um, particle sees, which is the wave number along the field times its parallel velocity, should be equal to the relativistic gyro frequency. So a fluctuation k and a particle with a parallel and an omega that meet these conditions will have a strong interaction. Okay, so we can just 
we assume that that is large, that frequency is high, um, it's possible to derive <coughs> a connection diffusion equation. Uh, this was done by John Skilling, independently by other people working on the solar wind. So let's see what the elements of this are. So U is the velocity <coughs> of the wave frame, assuming that there is one. And it's a composite of the lambda <coughs> velocity times this times the outbound speed with this weighting coefficient that basically depends on how much, how many outbound waves are going to the right, so that would be the new plus, and how many outbound waves are going to the left, uh, those, that would be the new minus. So if you have just as many waves going in one direction as the other, then the wave frame has zero velocity, and the only velocity you have to worry about is the plasma velocity. And so this part of the equation says that the cosmic rays are advented at this velocity uh, and respond to compression, so they evolve in momentum space uh, due to compression of this velocity. Then there's some spatial diffusion. And the spatial diffusion is produced by um, scattering from both sides of wave, and it's along the field only. And then there's diffusion in momentum space. And for outbound waves, the diffusion in momentum space is pretty small. Um, it's a order of the outbound speed over the speed of light squared compared to the um, just pitch angle scattering. Uh, but it is there. And it, it basically represents um, Fermi acceleration. It depends on waves moving to both the right and the left. Okay. So, we can derive fluid equations from this equation. And here's the content of those equations. So gyro resonant streaming cosmic rays will transfer momentum to co-propagating waves, and they'll absorb momentum from counter-propagating waves. So this is intuitive. Um, counter-propagating waves try to push them in the other direction. Co-propagating waves, um, they'll Absorb. Sorry, get <coughs> What I didn't tell you, and I don't really have time to show, is that if the cosmic rays are streaming faster than the outbound speed, that will destabilize the co propagating outbound waves, and the growth rate of the instability can be written in this form. So it's scaled by the proton gyro frequency times the number density of cosmic rays divided by the ion density. And it's factored here, the Lorentz factor gamma to the alpha minus one, uh, reflects the fact that as you go to more and more energetic cosmic rays with larger and larger gyro radii, um, there are fewer particles that can resonantly amplify that way because the gyro radii are big. And then here's this drift anisotropy factor. And even though the ratio of the cosmic ray number density to the ion number density is typically extremely small, <coughs> um, the gyro frequency is fast. 
these alpine wave packets um, can move essentially at the ion thermal speed. So there are thermal ions. So this is important in hot gas. And then um, there's another mechanism, actually, which Peter Goldreich worked on, which is that the waves <coughs> are distorted um, because the background field that they propagate in is not homogeneous, and it tends to kind of shear uh, the waves apart. So if you have a small scale turbulence in the medium, um, this can be important. Um, so just to kind of complete the picture, uh, again, in the limit of strong scattering, you can relate this spatial gradient in the cosmic rays uh, to their gradient in momentum space. And you can show that if you, if you consider just waves streaming in the direction, uh, streaming down the cosmic ray gradient, so just in plus, say, and not in minus, that this term here on the right-hand side is actually proportional to the growth rate of the waves. So a gradient, the density gradient in the cosmic ray produces and un can produce an unstable anisotropy in momentum space. So um, the pressure gradient drives anisotropy, uh, waves absorb cosmic ray momentum, and the waves then transfer momentum and energy to the background band. So this is the microscopic basis for um, a fluid treatment of cosmic rays. <coughs> and I want to distinguish between two pictures, uh, which is becoming, uh, so this is kind of under increasing discussion in the literature. So the, the classical picture is that the waves that the cosmic rays scatter from are waves that they generate themselves, according to this streaming instability. So they're advented at the outbound speed relative to the fluid. They can also diffuse, uh, depending on what the scattering frequency is. Um, their pressure gradient um, along the magnetic field accelerates and heats the background gas. So this is the classical picture. On the other hand, you can say, well, the interstellar medium or the intergalactic medium is a turbulent place. Um, you just have turbulence. You don't need cosmic rays to generate turbulence. So what would be the consequence of, of that picture? Um, well, the cosmic rays would still advent with fluid if they're frequently scattered, if you have enough turbulence, um, and use along the magnetic field. But instead of uh, donating energy to the medium, they would absorb energy from it by second order Fermi acceleration. These are two very different pictures. Do cosmic rays give up energy to the medium, or do they take energy from it? And which is correct um, depends on <coughs> details of the turbulent cascade and what kind of medium you're in. So estimates for the interstellar medium up to now show pretty consistently that cosmic rays up to 1 to 200 GeV are most likely self-confined. And that is where most of the pressure and energy density is. Then above some critical energy, probably around a couple hundred GeV, um, there are not enough cosmic rays, resonant cosmic rays, to generate the waves that will confine them. And so that you must go over to some other source of scattering. Uh, interstellar turbulent cascade or some sort of structure. Okay, so there's been a lot of interest in, in implementing cosmic rays in kind of large scale gas dynamic calculations like galactic winds or the evolution of the intercluster medium. And, and this, is, this is not so easy to, to do. And to, and I think that's given rise to various approximations that have been made in the literature. So first of all, um, you not only have to do gas dynamics, you have to do magneto hydrodynamics. You have to include magnetic fields in your calculation uh, because the cosmic rays follow the field lines and the heating rate due to cosmic rays depends on the alphabet speed. So you need to know the direction and the strength of the magnetic field. Uh, and that has sort of hung various people up. Okay. Another um, point which has been grappled with is that the self-confinement picture can, can break down, uh, even <coughs> on its own terms. So you can show that if there are no sources of cosmic rays and
and you can neglect diffusion, that this quantity, um, the fluid speed plus the outlet speed, times the cosmic ray pressure to one over its gamma, so gamma C would be four thirds for relativistic fluid, the divergence of that quantity is, is zero. So this can lead to some counterintuitive and deep forbidden behavior. So imagine for a second that U is actually zero and the alpha speed is decreasing as the cosmic rays stream along, we can say the gas is getting more dense. So you're streaming into a cloud, the gas is getting more dense, the alpha speed is going down. Um, that implies that the cosmic ray pressure must be going up to conserve this quantity. Um, so then you have, that would predict that the cosmic rays are streaming off their density gradient. But that's wrong. So, so what happens? And this is not a new problem. It was pointed out by Skilling in the 1970s. So, um, so what happens? And this has been verified in uh, simulations by Josh Wiener, an O student at the UC Santa Barbara, that um, the cosmic ray gradient just flattens. And so, if you if you launch, say you have a cosmic ray source here, and it's moving into a medium with an increase in alpha speed. Um, it will just adjust itself to constant density. And then, if the outbound speed starts going down again, uh, sorry, going up again, uh, then the cosmic rays are re-engaged. But uh, you need a robust numerical method that can handle this problem. So, um, it doesn't seem to be, it doesn't seem to be a shock front, although we do find, so when the cosmic rays re-engage, uh, they start depositing energy and momentum again, and that tends to kind of erode the cloud. But cooling can arrest it. So actually, we're working you know, on this combination of cooling, heating, and acceleration to try to see what happens. But um, it, was, it was very interesting to actually see this, you know, in Josh's simulation. <coughs>
some time ago that that a supplemental source of heating is required, and with kind of standard assumptions about the magnetic field and cosmic ray density in our galaxy, uh, we were able to get a good fit to the temperature. Um, I want to show you a little bit that we did with um, cross-field diffusion. So cross-field diffusion is important in any situation like um, AGM bubbles, where you the Fermi bubbles, we have a sharp boundary in uh, the cosmic ray distribution. So how do cosmic rays actually cross magnetic field lines? So we made some very simple models which combine inhomogeneous magnetic field with the high frequency scattering that we think happens as a result of this instability. And so what happens, um, so this is illustrated for an extremely simple model, but each of the fields are point primarily in this direction and <coughs> consist of nested helices. And what happens is cosmic rays orbit on one helix for a long time, and then they get pitch angle scattered to the next helix, and they hang out on that helix, and then they go to another one. You can see that here. And if we have a field with more structure, so now we have structure not just single, helices all on the same side, but a more complicated structure, uh, they still get trapped for a while, then they have some stochastic wandering, then they get trapped again. And we were able to um, compute these running diffusion coefficients, which uh, basically show the square of the displacement from the original position divided by time. So this should level off for a you know, sort of standard random walk process, and, um, and it actually does. Uh, so here are some running diffusion coefficients. And we were able to bracket the cross-field diffusivity um, with these two lines. So this minimum line represents scattering uh, one gyro or, sorry, one gyro radius per gyro orbit. So this is the diffusion coefficient that you get for the pitch angle scattering completely uniform. And then uh, the, the upper limit is if the, the field has kind of a characteristic eddy size, and every time a cosmic ray has gone around one eddy, it hops to the next eddy. So it's kind of an eddy diffusion model. And that forms the upper envelope of our model, <coughs> and they kind of go in between, and we're trying to carry this further now uh, with more realistic turbulent fields. There's some nice lab experiments that study cross-field diffusion. Uh, this is in the Torpec plasma. Uh, this is work by Ivo Furno um, to really try to kind of quantify this in the presence of electromagnetic fluctuations. So um, this is a summary. This is where we are. So cosmic rays are an important constituent of the interstellar medium of the galaxy. In galaxies like ours, they make about a third of the energy density, interstellar energy density. Um, if they're self-confined by plasma facilities that they drive themselves, they transfer energy and momentum to the background gas, uh, which heats it and can drive outflows. Um, there are a lot of new opportunities to study this, um, both the cosmic rays themselves, uh, analogous problems in the lab, um, advances to simulation, we're understanding magnetic turbulence uh, better than we once did and how it interacts with energetic forces. Um, so this is a good time to study um, cosmic rays. Thank you.
the original one uh, was that, so, so imagine cosmic rays um, going directly uh, along the magnetic field, and then in order to isotropize, they have to turn them around. They have to start going backwards. So as cosmic rays approach, uh, turning their direction around, um, they're going almost perpendicular to the field. Um, and they're, the waves which satisfy the resonance condition, so d parallel is very small, um, are, uh, have a very short parallel wavelength. And they can um, cyclotron down on the thermal lines. So you remove this cone of waves. Okay. So the thought was, well, you know, okay, the cosmic rays can kind of make it, make it so far, but before they go over, um, they run out of waves. And they stay like this. Um, this doesn't actually give you streaming at the sound speed, it gives you streaming at um, kind of C over two. Something like that. Because you know, everything's still going forward, but just kind of um, and, and Russell and Kultra uh, wrote a paper on this a long time ago, which he showed that um, when, as you get to these cosmic rays that are going almost perpendicular to the field, you have small fluctuations in the amplitude of the field due to these waves, and so they just mirror. So they just, you, you just kind of kick them back. Okay. Um, then there's the fact that um, in a very high beta plasma, the um, the wave speed is um, not the outfit speed. As you, so you know, the thermal ion speed uh, starts becoming uh, yes, very important. Um, but you also have an enormous amount of uh, ion lambda gapping in those plasmas. And I think that it's just very hard to sustain the waves all together. Um, that still doesn't lead to the formulations that you have in mind. Um, and those were, I think, concocted purely <coughs> by people calculating the metric. Um, if there are any practitioners of that here, a couple of defendants, I would love to know why you did this. So initially, you mentioned that the energy loss in our galaxy is from and advection, but only that means they, they leave the galaxy. That's yep. not important. Um, but what is, do, they, do they carry the magnetic fields with them as they leave, or do the magnetic fields stay behind as the cosmic rays leave? Yeah, so that's, so that's a great question. So um, they, they are kind of an insulationary force. Uh, and there are, these, um, there are these instabilities. So the magnetic fields themselves tend to be buoyant. And, um, and the cosmic rays can can kind of help that buoyancy. And um, so, you know, there are these um, there are these bubbles, kind of called Parker, Parker loops, where um, you know the field might actually escape. It's a little bit difficult to know um, if and when it, it does from the calculations, but um, there are galactic dynamo calculations, which you've probably seen, they're actually based on that. So having um, having some field escape, which having these kind of loops of magnetized plasma cosmic rays floating into the RGM. I think, I, I mean, we, we know that there's this, you know, kind of profuse circumgalactic medium around many galaxies, and it probably has magnetic fields and cosmic rays in it. <coughs>
it's on a neutral banding that, uh, so the, the favored mechanism for recovery rate acceleration is in shocks, so called the piece of shock acceleration, and that depends on having a population of upstream waves that will return the cosmic rate of shock many times, and if those waves are wiped out uh, by iron neutral friction, you can't get the mechanism going. So there is also this efficiency issue. Uh, and I'm not sure, I, I'm not sure for, for R2, so for R220, it seems like it can be explained by the law. Uh, but, so the efficiency issue is uncertain. But I think it's good. So we look for that so if I, so if R220, so if we could if we could beckon R220 to come forward and um no, no, you have to do it. Um, so actually there's another interesting thing about R220. So um, you know there there's T the gamma ray detection too, and there's Hawk and CTA that are planned. So the radiation field in R220 is so intense that um that the gamma, the TEV gamma rays, becomes oddly thick to TEV gamma rays. So you, you take this big bite out of the gamma ray spectrum at the TEV energies. And so it's not clear um, that you'll, so what you want to do, you want, you want a big G V telescope. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so I think I heard you say that uh, cosmic ray theory is not ready for coarse greening and galaxy Thank you. 
reception over in the Physics Graduate Lounge, and I want to remind all of you that there's a public talk tomorrow evening at 7 p.m., and let's thank Ellen again. <laughs>